this has gone better than I thought. It's about, ah, the walls are about 80% built. I've got some headers and beams to set. You're gonna see the crane on my truck working in just a couple minutes. This is one of the glue lambs that I salvaged out of those used glue lambs. I'm spanning 14 feet across this garage door opening. It's not carrying much. It looks like it's carrying much, but it's the gable end truss that's actually holding the roof and transferring that load out to the perimeter walls, the side walls. But there's nothing wrong with overkill on a beam. So I'm putting double trimmers at each end. That is something that I do anytime the opening's over about like six, eight feet. Double the trimmers, lots of muscle, really needed on a garage door opening. And I'm gonna set this beast up there with my crane. Wish me luck. So this is the first chance I had to use my Rube Goldberg Plumb Bob supporting jig. And it turned out it worked really good. And I guess we can infer from that that maybe old Rube got some work done sometimes, didn't he? But anyhow, so I made a little, I made a little uh, scribe, a little gauge for checking the, the distance. Ambidextrous, both ways. It's perfect, and so now to hold this, before I set the garage header, I'm just gonna throw a couple pieces of half inch sheeting on here, throw, I don't know, maybe a dozen nails in it, so that the wall is really held, so that whatever else happens when I'm setting that beam by myself, this wall won't fall down. Okay, I'm not gonna shoot the trimmer, because that needs to be nice and straight. We'll take care of that after a little bit. And I'm not putting too much in it because I don't have the blocks in there yet, and those studs probably have bows in them. But I can shoot this. So I'm going to put the jib on here. It is vastly optimistic to think that a, the back of a one-ton Ford on a shop belt crane can put a top shift 22 feet in the air. I only use it occasionally and cautiously and we're going to do that today. So everybody has their running shoes and parachutes on, no hard hats required because they wouldn't save you. So you know I just am really thankful that when I'm doing this by myself I can't spell O-S-H-A. I'm thankful. Um, it has its place. It's vitally important. When you have people working together and you can't anticipate the other guy's moves, I mean, safety's no joke. And if I'm treating it like a joke, it's just because I have no choice. Having said that, there's one egregious safety violation that I'm gonna be going with right now, and that's this. I don't have a bail over the top of this line in this little pulley. The only thing that's holding it there is gravity. And so I have to always remember if there's any kind of a failure or a whip or anything that interrupts the steady bearing of the load across the top of this snatch block, somebody needs to get out of the way. Here we go. So as sketchy as this looks, it's just not that bad. Because that beam probably weighs, oh, a hundred and a half, right? So that's not much. I don't know, maybe, I don't think it's 200 pounds. I think it's 150 pounds. And right now, the center of the pin is six feet from the load. Now, I can take my 750-pound welder and hold it almost straight out, which puts it about seven feet from the pin with, you know, my just the main, main uh, boom. And so, I mean, the difference between 150-pound 20, being 20 feet in the air, six feet from the pin, and a 750-pound welder three feet from the ground, seven feet from the pin, is vastly weighted to the welder. I mean, that crane takes it. So just based on that insignificant evidence, I got a safety factor built in here of five to one. That's just plenty for me today. We're gonna run that thing up in the air, set it on the trimmers, and have this front wall tied together.
need a lot of fire blocks in this job. I'm coming up eight feet so that they also function as a shear block and strengthen the, the edge between the bottom two courses of plywood and the top couple of courses. So might as well gang cut these, right? I mean, you don't want to be cutting each individual one when so many of them are typical. And typical, in this case, on a 16-inch layout, is 14 and 3 eighths. Cut it about an eighth of an inch short so it'll go in. It'll still nail up and it'll save you climbing back down off of the scaffold or the sawhorse or the ladder to make a cut that you should have already had taken care of to begin with. So I mark the first one, cut it, and now with this in hand, make sure it's right. You don't want to duplicate something that is wrong. It's perfect. I add visually what it takes for the kerf, which is about that much, and mark it, and then just keep track that I always cut on the left-hand side of the line. All right, I made a series of cuts with my good old daily driver, Mag 77. I'm gonna try this thing for the next run. Honest opinion, that Makita was smooth. It was smoother, easier on my wrist. Hmm. Okay, we'll see. So when I'm putting in blocks, and trusting the length of the blocks to not accumulate a bow in a roof truss or a floor joist or a stud, I just drop back, hook five or six back, and check to make sure, yep, I'm just a little under layout, and a little under layout is way better than a little over layout. So I'm going to loosen up a couple. And keep moving. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but I rigged up a jig for holding my plumb bob the same distance off both sides of the corner. That's because working by myself, I don't have the luxury of having someone at the top holding it, someone down at the bottom measuring it, someone out on a brace adjusting it. So I've just got that locked in at a 3x3 three three offset so that when I climb down, I can measure both sides at once and then know what I have to do and verify without having to climb back up. Let me show you. So I've got this big awkward gauge block that I can slide in here and verify the distance from that direction. Pretty close. And I can verify the distance from this direction. So we learned from high school chemistry using a balance that when a pendulum is working, if it swings equidistant in both directions, then it is, in fact, giving you what you need to know. And that is equidistant, so we're three inches in both directions. The key to working off the ground by yourself is to prep everything that you can ahead of time. Cut your special blocks, or if you can't cut your blocks from the ground, have your saw up here. Try to think through the location of your blocks and your supplies and how much distance you need to work and that you don't have any hang-ups on your nail gun. Make sure you've got enough nails in your bags, and all that's intuitive, right? But as you get better and better and better at that, there's almost never a reason on a small building to worry about having any help. Now that's obviously not quite true. You've seen a couple times when doggone it, I just had to have a little help. But there's plenty of times that a nail gun, a Burke bar, a piece of scaffolding, the right ladder, and just uh, a little creativity will get the job done 
by yourself, on time, on budget, and with a certain amount of satisfaction for having solved one more construction problem. So I drive the 16 pennies in about halfway. It gives me a little shelf to set the board on. I've snapped the line up there at four foot and an eighth of an inch. So I can just kind of fudge it in there. I can see the line hit just below it. On this wall on the back, I was in a hurry yesterday afternoon. It was hot. I didn't have much time. And so I just trusted the nails. And there was one spot where the slab dipped down about a quarter of an inch and I dropped the sheet on there and shot it in. And sure enough, it was out of straight, and so it made a little deviation that I fought all the way to the top of the wall. But all the sheets have bearing, and all the nailing's in place, and the substrate will be fine, and it'll hold the rain guard, and the siding will go on it, on it, and it's fine, but it bugged me. And so on this wall, I'm going to rest it on the nails and check it with the chalk line. So. This is not a big deal. I mean, half inch plywood is just not that heavy. If you think a little bit about how to handle it, you don't keep track of, of leverage and instead of just always horsing it, look for a way to tip it up on its corner or rock it up across the center point or flip one corner up in order to get something under it so you can cut it. You just think about how to handle the material in a way that you can do it. You don't always have to call for help. You don't always have to wait for the other guy to walk across the job to help you lift something. And uh, if you're careful about it, and if you maintain some flexibility as you get older, you're probably gonna be able to do this until you're what? Maybe 64 or 65? Is that good? I don't know if that's good or not, but it's where we find ourselves today. So think about and pay attention to how you handle the material. So I've gotta put a header in here. It's one of the glue lambs that was salvaged from the old glue lambs that were sawn, resawn, in my field last winter. It is at least, I'll say, four times the strength that it needs for this span. And uh, I don't care because the cost was right. And if I can just figure out a way to muscle this thing into position, we're going to go right ahead and have a nice strong opening, put the shear over the top, and get this thing ready for the trusses. So these are three inch nails. 16 pennies are often three and a quarter. That means a quarter of an inch sticks out the back side of your through nails, which will tear your fingertip open. So three inch meets code, three inch saves your hands. Use three inch if you can. This is a bright finish. That just means it's got glue or whatever it is that's on there. Not galvanized, it's not galvanized, it's not stainless, it's not ring shank, it's just a three inch bright collated nail. 21 degrees. Now this is important. If your nail gun is not setting the nails through this crown plate, take time to set them because in a little while I'm going to be up here walking these plates and I don't want the head of the nail sticking up a quarter of an inch, hanging up the toe of my boot and sending me or anyone else to the ground. So just make sure that your nails are set up here on the crown. So that's most of it. 
It's bulked in, it's nailed off. It's a very strong shear diaphragm now in that direction. Needs some bracing the other way, but there's no wind coming, so I'm not gonna worry too much about that. I've gotta frame the window in here in this corner. It benefits the stairway. So I'm gonna make it plenty high so that when these grandsons come tearing down the stairs and try to make the corner around the winders, nobody pitches out through a window that's just a little too low. I'm gonna hold that up so that Ben gets the benefit of the window from up in his office. Once that's located, wipe out the shear, be done with this wall, and be almost ready for a set of trusses. Well, it's gonna be good to get this wall sheeted. I mean, it's strong, it builds me in some time so that I can frame the interior partitions and brace it and put the catwalks up and be ready for the trusses. I've been worried about that. But this little cell right here, this little cavity is going to be buried forever as soon as I throw in the rest of this sheeting, which means this is the last chance to put any insulation in there. So I've got this left over from, I think, my shop product or the spec house or something. I'm gonna put that in with the craft paper face towards the climate controlled side. Now that's nonsense because this is going to be facing directly into a cell that's fully insulated also. But if you've got a choice and if you've got paper on your fiberglass insulation, put it toward the heated side of the wall. Eight pennies, not twelves. In the next video in this series, you're going to watch me building the walls, setting the beams and the floor joists, and doing the work that encloses and defines the bathroom and the upstairs office. I'm pretty sure that the crane, once again, is going to get the MVP award on that part of the project. But I better hurry, because winter is coming on fast. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.